Hello listeners and welcome to the NK News podcast recorded in Seoul on the afternoon of August 16th, 2022. And my in-studio guest today is Doug Bandow visiting Seoul from Washington, D.C. Uh, before we get started, a reminder, please, to review this podcast, share it, like it, subscribe, follow us on Twitter, all of those good things. Uh, and the karma will surely come back to you manyfold. Doug Bando is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute specializing in foreign policy and civil liberties. He describes himself on Twitter as policy nerd and journalist wannabe, graduate of Stanford Law School and former special assistant to President Ronald Reagan. His thoughts can be found at cato.org and on the Twitterverse at Doug underscore Bando. Doug, welcome on the show. Happy to be on. Doug, you were last on the podcast in late May 2019. That was a different time. Uh, what brings you to Korea now? Well, we had a conference over the weekend looking at the idea of Korean unification, one Korea. So I figured I'd take a little time and drop in and see friends. I haven't been here since uh, before COVID. I see. Okay, so there's been a few things happening uh, in the last week, I guess, then on, on Korea, inter-Korean affairs, unification, etc. Okay. So since you were last here on May 20, uh, in May 2019, three and a bit years ago, have any of your fundamental beliefs or attitudes about Korea and or the U.S.-Korea alliance changed or been slightly amended since then? No, my views are pretty much the same. My concerns over what's going on in the peninsula have increased, certainly looking at North Korea and where they are at and what that portends for the future. Okay, well, I've been reading your op-eds for years, so let me see if I could summarize for the listeners at home, and you can correct me where I'm wrong. You believe that there's no need for an alliance between the U.S. and Korea now. You believe that South Korea is big and strong enough to stand up to threats from North Korea and any other large authoritarian-led undemocratic neighbor. You believe that the U.S. should cancel the alliance, pull its troops out of the Korean Peninsula, and let Koreans take care of their own defense 100%. Is that basically right? That's basically right, though, of course, it doesn't mean doing it overnight. It means over an extended period of time working with the ROK. Uh, also, and this is interesting, given that you are uh, situated firmly on the political right in U.S. politics, you share at least one thing, one belief with the far left. That is, you believe that it's a bad thing for America to show leadership in the world and that it should stop. Uh, is this because you would actively welcome a Pax China or a world dominated by strongmen who think it's okay to seize territory if and when they want to? Well, there's a difference between exercising leadership and being involved in every war, big and small. And to me, that's the difference. I think the U.S. should be involved in the world. I think Americans should be involved in the world. But that doesn't necessarily mean military domination. And certainly America's policies over the last two decades have demonstrated the cost of, quote, leadership, unquote. So I don't like that kind of leadership. Okay, but does, does nature not abhor a vacuum? Well, the question, you know, everyone says that, but it's not at all clear that uh, our being absent means there would necessarily be vacuums or other powers that can work together. And that's one of the problems. When the U.S. is dominant, it makes it harder to have other countries working together to fill that. That uh, if one looks at, for example, the role of Japan or certainly Europe, you know, have remained essentially infantile when it comes to military matters because they can rely on the U.S. I do want to come back to Europe a bit later on because that I, I think the last few months have uh, suggested some uh, maybe some tempering of your argument there may be necessary, but I'll come back to that one later. Uh, let's go through one of your recent articles, and then I'm going to ask you some hard questions, or at least try to. Uh, on July 12th, the American Institute for Economic Research pub published your op-ed piece, U.S. Celebrates Alliance with Seoul, but is South Korea worth a nuclear war? Is the question in the title yours, or did a sub-editor write that? No, that's my question. Okay, because it's a provocative one. Uh, I think it's obvious that most Americans would say no, but most South Koreans would feel that South Korea is worth saving and worth fighting for. I mean, is that the, uh, the, the, the bifurcated choice that we are faced with? Is South Korea worth a nuclear war? Well, it's, it's important to ask the ultimate question. I think many of these alliances have been kind of carried on under easy assumptions. I mean, you talk to Americans about defending Taiwan, and there's a presumption of policymakers that China wouldn't dare take the U.S. on as long as the U.S. exercises leadership. I mean, that's often used as a term mm -hmm. without taking into account the disparity of interests and, and the fact that China, in fact, probably would be willing to fight over what it views as an existential interest, which is not existential for the United States. So it's easy to make these assumptions. And I think Korea is one of those where an alliance that was built during the Cold War that had a very different set of interests and necessities today is assumed to be necessary. And the question of extended deterrence and the changes with North Korea's nuclear program 
suddenly raise the issue of nuclear attack on the United States, depending upon where the North Korean nuclear program goes. That requires thinking about this as opposed to assuming that uh, nothing's ever going to come of that. So that's why that's part of the title. Now, why was this piece published on the website of the American Institute for Economic Research? That seems like an unusual place for an article about security issues. It is, but the president of that institute is Bill Ruger, who's quite interested in foreign policy issues. And in fact, recently came from the Charles Koch Foundation, where he was uh, very involved in sending money to uh, foreign policy think tanks. Now, you mentioned the idea that the, uh, the American-South Korean alliance is something that was forged during the Cold War, when the Soviet Union was a threat, now it's not. What about the argument that the U.S. military presence in Korea today, uh, if not when it was begun 70 years ago, is as much, if not more, about China than North Korea? Is it not in the U.S. interest to remain in Korea as a bulwark against potential Chinese adventurism or expansionism? Well, that only is uh, correct if you presume that the South Koreans will allow the U.S. to turn South Korea into an enemy of China in the event of a war, including over an issue like Taiwan. It's not at all clear to me that uh, South Koreans necessarily would want to be dragged into such a conflict, because to allow the U.S. to use bases and forces in South Korea means South Korea would immediately become a military target, as well as a long-term enemy of a country that has a very long memory and will always be next door. You know, so I'm very skeptical of the dual use idea that the U.S. kind of planting all these forces around the region necessarily can use them against China. And it's not at all clear what an infantry division would do against China. I presume that no one in America really thinks there's going to be a ground war against China. So I'm very skeptical of that. And it's not at all clear to me that uh, you know, South Korea or Japan or other countries in a crunch would actually support the U.S. in that endeavor. Now, uh, why do you think it's okay to abrogate alliances? And what does this say about the reliability or unreliability of the United States as a partner in literally anything? Well, there's no reason that alliances should be forever. You know, the point is, the, uh, this alliance has been in existence for 70 years. That's a pretty long time. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's a Not fair as long as the uh, Portuguese-UK alliance. It's, what, uh, 700 years and counting? Well, I'm very glad to hear it. I'm sure that the Brits are still good for uh, defending uh, Portugal in, uh, in a tight spot. But it strikes me that alliances, uh, you know, foreign policy overall and alliances specifically should be based on circumstances, you know, that they shouldn't become permanent entities. That, uh, I mean, we saw that with NATO where the, the enemy disappears and the alliance continues. It raises questions, you know, is the alliance a means or an end? I think during the Cold War, the U.S. had a reason to intervene to save South Korea from uh, the, uh, the North Korean attack backed by the Soviets and the Chinese. Indeed, the U.S. helped set up the circumstances in mm. terms of the... Uh, occupation and uh, refusing to arm the South, et cetera. Yeah. You know, but the argument for that really did disappear years ago. So I don't think you How? keep it. Why? Because South Korea has moved so vastly beyond you know, North Korea. I mean, I find it very strange that all of America's allies are helpless weaklings that can never stand on their own. I just don't believe that. How about that concept that, okay, you've, you've walked into an antique store or a store with expensive stuff that's very delicate, and you see a sign that says, you break, you pay, or you break this, you buy this. So going back to what you just said, in 1949, the Soviet Union and the United States came in and literally broke Korea into two. Uh, it's still in two. Uh, the United States' stated aim at the time was to bring freedom and democracy to the whole of the Korean Peninsula. Why should it get to cut and run now when that mission is still incomplete? No, the mission may be incomplete in the sense of the entire peninsula, but I don't believe the U.S. saved South Korea in order to save North Korea. The U.S. saved South Korea to save South Korea. I mean, the U.S. ended the war... You know, you know, far short of uh, you know, el eliminating Kim Il-sung's rule because it viewed the cost of trying to continue ruinous. It decided that three years of conflict on the Korean Peninsula was commitment enough. I think that was a fair judgment. And there's no reason 70 years later to say we have to stay until we're able to unite the peninsula. I'd love to see it united, but that's not America's responsibility. Okay, but you're only going back to 1953. I'm going a little bit back further to 1945 when America said we're going to be responsible for bringing peace and democracy to the Korean Peninsula. It didn't just say this half south of the 30th parallel. It actually said the whole of it. Now, sure, the Soviet Union got in the way there and made sure that two separate countries were set up, but uh, that mission of the United States from 45 hasn't been completed yet. I don't think that was the mission of the United States. The question is, at the end of uh, World War II, the greatest war in human history, the question is, how do you stop this, and then how do you divide the world dealing with the Soviet Union? We did that in Germany. You know, the point is, there was a division, and the U.S. accepted a reality that it wasn't going to be able to, in the short term, achieve an end that it would like to have. The same thing with the Korean Peninsula.
I don't believe that dividing the peninsula gave the U.S. fundamental responsibility forever to unite the peninsula. It'd be wonderful to be able to do so, but it's not America's responsibility to do that. I think America's responsibility was to preserve South Korea and allow it to uh, become a kind of country that can defend itself and preserve freedom in its own territory. And over the long term, let's hope we uh, can spread that to North Korea. Now, in this article that, uh, that you wrote, that you had published in early July, you wrote, uh, if Pyongyang gains the potential, a serious possibility would be enough of dropping nukes on even a couple U.S. cities, the military picture will look very different for Washington. Now, the idea of, uh, of North Korea hitting a, an American city with a nuclear bomb is actually nothing new. Uh, the uh, semi-official North Korean spokesman Kim Yong-chol, based in Japan, said in a, uh, a couple of interviews on television as early as 2003 that, the US, uh, that North Korea has the ability to strike the U.S. mainland uh, with nuclear weapons. So at what point do you draw the line and say, okay, now it's real, now we should get out? Well, it's real when it's real. You know, the notion of a North Korean saying that it's real doesn't mean it's real. No, but you're saying it's real now. Yeah, I'm saying it is approaching that. It's the development of ICBMs that it, if they are accurate enough that they allow the targeting of American cities, we passed into a new world. This is not just uh, publishing YouTube videos showing New York in flames threatening to turn an American city into a mm -hmm. lake of fire as they've threatened Seoul and other places. The point is, if they have that kind of a capability, MIRV warheads, even you know, SLBM, submarine-launched uh, ballistic missiles, we're in a world in which North Korea potentially could be a second-rank power alongside United Kingdom, France, India, Pakistan. And that does transform the world. See, extended deterrence is quite easy if your opponent is not able to attack you. So throughout uh, the entire Cold War, North Korea did have, had no ability to attack the continental United States. Its threat was limited to uh, North uh, East Asia, particularly the Korean Peninsula. The creation of, nu of uh, nuclear weapons and long-range missiles transforms that entirely. And that's the point where the U.S. has to decide, is it prepared to go to war recognizing the chance that the consequence could be incineration of American cities? And that requires at least a debate as opposed to assuming, well, of course, you know, who cares, right? Who cares if a few million Americans die? You know, Washington's primary responsibility is to the American people. It has to hold that, uh, you know, kind of the highest regard. And that might require changing its alliance structure, or at the very least, its commitments to alliances. Are you saying that an alliance really only makes sense when the adversary is a weak power without the ability to strike back? What I'm saying is an alliance makes sense if it enhances American security. My objective for America is to protect Americans. Now, that might be advanced by protecting other countries. But the objective of America is not to protect the rest of the world. The, Ameri the objective of America is to protect Americans. And that comes first. Uh, you wrote in the same piece, President Joe Biden's world is one in which the U.S. defends everyone from everything. Yet, uh, surely this is clearly hyperbole. When you published this piece in mid-July, it was already clear that the U.S. was not about to go to war to defend Ukraine against Russia. So why did you say this? Well, of course it's hyperbole, but there's a lot of accuracy to it. That is, the U.S. goes to war in Afghanistan. The U.S. goes to war in Libya. The U.S. goes to war in Iraq. The U.S. is basically threatening Iran to go to war. The U.S. is fighting a proxy war with Ukraine. The U.S. is arming Ukraine. The American officials have exulted in the fact they've killed Russian generals. They've helped sink Russian ships. And frankly, I think this is rather extraordinary and dangerous to you know, make those kind of you know, comments, even though it's fairly common as part of a proxy war. The U.S. defends all of Europe. The U.S. brings in countries like Montenegro mm -hmm. and uh, you know, North Macedonia, which have no relevance at all to American security. The U.S. talks about having an obligation to defend Taiwan, even though there is no legal obligation. You know, so what one finds is an American willingness to go to war all over the world, you know, in most of these places without really thinking about it. Um, so would I be correct in, in suggesting that you're not just skeptical, highly, of the U.S. Nor, uh, US Korean alliance, but also the U.S. NATO alliance? Oh, yeah. I think that it's far more ridiculous that the Europeans you know, are unwilling and unable, uh, claim to be unable to defend themselves after 70 years. You know, they have, uh, you know, depending upon what uh, measure you use, five to ten times the economic potential of Russia. They already spend two to three times as much on the military. You know, these are countries which are quite capable, technologically advanced. And we've seen with the kind of Russia's disastrous attack on Ukraine, the idea that Russia can roll to the Atlantic and take over the continent, I think, is ridiculous. But at the same time, the, the war on Russia, uh, the, Russia's war on Ukraine 
has breathed new life into NATO, and NATO is now actually uh, making promises to pay those amounts that you uh, years ago notably said they should be paying. Oh, they, they, they make the promises, but they never live up to them. Look at what's happening in Germany. The Germans are already saying they probably won't make 2%. You know, they're playing games on the fund they've set up. They're not changing the base budget to bring it to 2%. We already see articles. You can see them in foreign policy. You can see others. The, uh, the Brits uh, you know, have, uh, have admitted this year they're not going to increase military spending, even though... Stories tell us how uh, you know, the defense minister has been complaining that they're basically uh, you know, they're desperate for money. You know, the Europeans are not going to do what they uh, don't have to do. And the fact the U.S. has not just relied on European promises, but instead has rushed another 20,000 troops to Europe, plus made a lot of new commitments in terms of units, uh, you know, ships, planes, and other things they're sending over, makes it very easy for the Europeans to back away. My prediction is that whenever a peace occurs, that the Europeans are going to very quickly forget their interest in increasing military spending, and they're going to be asking the U.S. to ever do more. Uh, and I doubt that you know, most of these countries will ever hit 2%. Okay, so your, uh, your main interest, as you say, is, is U.S. security interests and, uh, and protecting American lives. Uh, but would the U.S. retreating from the Korean Peninsula, leaving South Korea open to unification by force with North Korea, make America any safer? Is the world... Not dangerous with a nuclear-armed North Korea expanding its territory through force or threat of force? Well, my presumption is that South Koreans won't sit uh, defenseless and let North Korea take them over. The South Korea will do what it needs to do in terms of its own armaments to defend itself from North Korea. I mean, I fail to understand why a country with uh, you know, 50 times the GDP of its neighbor and twice the population is unable to defend itself. In what world does a non-nuclear-armed state being threatened by a nuclear-armed state, not need help. I don't understand well, that. because the, uh, the non-nuclear state doesn't have to be a non-nuclear state. Aha, so here we come to the, the nub of your argument, the crux of your argument. Are you actually seriously in support of South Korea going nuclear? And I don't mean restationing American nuclear weapons in South Korea. I mean South Korea actually developing, buying, building, and storing its own nuclear weapons. What I'd say is that that is a second best solution, but it's better than the original solution, which is extended deterrence. I think a n nuclear weapon for South Korea is better than extended deterrence that has the American homeland at risk. Why? Why is this a, a better option than extended deterrence from the U.S.? Please walk us through that. Because... If South Korea has independent nuclear weapons, the North isn't going to be lobbing nukes at the United States. If the North gets the potential, the ability to target American cities, and a war occurs on the peninsula, then that is a real danger for the United States. I don't see any reason to put the American homeland at risk for that reason. You worked for the Reagan administration back in the 1980s. Was not mutually, ex mutually assured destruction or MAD a concept back then? It was, and it's, Why one, is it it's, not one, it's, it's now? one Ronald Reagan really didn't like. Why? Because uh, he was horrified at the thought that the only answer to an attack from the other country is to murder their own citizens. That's why he supported missile defense. Reagan was horrified by the fact that the only response between the U.S. and the Soviet Union was uh, mad, was mutual assured destruction. My view is that if there's going to be mutual assured destruction on the Korean Peninsula, let it be on the Korean Peninsula. There's no reason for the U.S. to add new sources of mutual assured destruction. The U.S. should try to diminish nuclear threats, not increase them. So the, uh, the missile defense system that you, uh, that you mentioned there, we have THAAD here in South Korea, which is owned and operated by the Americans on, US soil, uh, on South Korean soil. Should that also be removed then? No, I think it's great. I mean, but it, it belongs to the Americans. Well, it should be sold to the South Koreans. Let the South Koreans take it over. I see. Um, do you believe in the principle of nuclear nonproliferation at all? Oh, I think that the problem here we have, yes, I would much prefer not to see the spread of nuclear weapons. But we don't have good alternatives here. If we assume that what North Korea is doing, the, you know, the Rand Corporation and Asan Institute came up a couple of years ago with an estimate that by 2027, North Korea could have 200 nuclear weapons. Sure. That would place it squarely within the second uh, you know, layer of nuclear states. I mean, mm -hmm. you look at uh, you know, Pakistan, India, the United Kingdom, France, it would place it ahead of Israel. You know, that plus the ability to use uh, you know, uh, ICBMs to send those missiles America's way <clears throat> would turn it into a very serious threat, potentially to the United States. So the question is, what is the best of a set of bad solutions? I would much prefer not to see the spread of nuclear weapons. But if the alternative is to put American cities at risk, I'd say let them spread. I don't have a better alternative than that. At least we should debate it as opposed to assume that it's America's, you know, should America have <clears throat> a, a nuclear deterrent for Saudi Arabia? Should America issue a nuclear deterrent for, I don't know, Egypt? I mean, go down the list. Lots of countries wouldn't mind having one. 
does it make sense for the United States to put their own citizens at risk in other places as well? How many of those countries are currently in a state of frozen war with a neighboring country in which the United States actually participated? Oh, they're all scared about Iran. If oh, they're Iran scared got, about Iran, yeah, but... Yeah. But uh, you know, none of them have the, the ability to defend themselves like South Korea. Again, South Korea, you know, the idea that somehow South, the current uh, balance and the current uh, you know, military balance between South and North is fixed is simply wrong. South Korea can do a lot more. You know, same thing in Japan. I mean, the idea that Japan would spend 1% of GDP forever on the military, you know, no wonder they uh, are behind China. In today's world, that doesn't make sense. We'll see if they get to 2%. But even 2% presumably isn't enough if they're actually worried about the Senkaku Islands. Countries around the world live in expectation that Americans will defend them. You know, the U.S. is effectively bankrupt. American citizens have their own lives to take care of. It's time to rethink those where American allies can defend themselves. In your piece, if I'm not mistaken, you said that you don't believe that Kim Jong-un is suicidal. Is that correct? That's right. So why do you think that he would actually strike American cities knowing that it would bring down nuclear hell upon his own country? He would do it in the context of a war. That is, imagine the U.S. is at war on the peninsula, and as in 1950, U.S. and ROK forces are advancing north to uh, you know, defeat the uh, North Korean military. That would mean the end of his regime. That is a circumstance where I could imagine him calling up the White House and saying, guess what, guys? You better pull back or I'm sending the nukes. That he's not going to launch an attack. He's not going to launch a preemptive attack. The man is not stupid. Mm -hmm. But these weapons are going to be used by him for deterrence. And if he finds his regime threatened, that is a moment where he might very well decide to use nukes. He might view why not. And under what circumstance do you imagine he might see his regime threatened? Well, no, I mean, imagine a war that started conventionally and U.S. and ROK forces are advancing north. What would be the trigger of that, though? Well, I mean, Th that, that war, which, let's be honest here, North Korea has for the last 70 years said, we're threatened, we're threatened, you're invading, you're invading. It hasn't happened. What is actually the trigger that you're well, imagining? Well, I would assume a trigger would be some kind of North Korean military provocation. That, but we've uh, seen them before. We've handled them before. Have you talked to the USFK generals here on the Korean Peninsula? They will say to you, they will show you, look, here's some examples. We know what to do in these situations oh, to sure. make sure it doesn't escalate. Sure, sure, but Why would you think it would escalate? Because what war is expected? You know, the point is... The, well, if there's one war that for the last 70 years has been expected, it's a resurgence or a reemergence of a second Korean war. No, I'm not sure it's been expected. The fact the U.S. is there has caused people to expect it won't happen. But you're the one saying they should go now. Yes, because the South Koreans can take that over. I mean, again, there's no reason for the U.S. to provide deterrence where the country itself can divide, provide deterrence. The point is that there's always a possibility of war. Many wars start because of mistake and error. Mm -hmm. you know, and no doubt the U.S. would do its best to ensure that the, a, a war did not break out. But I, I've also spent most of my time working on Korea where everybody tells me how the North Koreans are crazy lunatics and uh, ideologically determined to take over the South. So if I give any credence to those arguments, and those, those are hawks who assume that they're going to attack sometime, there are possibilities out there. If a war started for whatever reason and event, you know, kind of developed in this way, and I go back to 1950, had it not been for Chinese intervention, the North Korean regime would have disappeared. Mm -hmm. The world would have been a much better place, but China intervened. If similar circumstances happen this time, China's not going to intervene. I don't believe that Xi Jinping has any interest in going to war to save that regime. You may be right. But uh, so then the question is, what would the North do if you're sitting in Pyongyang? Suddenly, the only way you can save yourself, well, you know, guess what? You have those nukes. Why do you have those nukes? You have those nukes as a deterrent. And that's the moment you can play that out. And that's where the U.S. would have to make a decision. And I don't think the U.S. should be in that position of having to make that decision. South Korea does not have nuclear weapons now, as far as we know. You're not, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you're not actually a, a nuclear a scientist. Uh, to the best of your knowledge, how long does it take to fit things together and make a nuclear bomb if you're starting from scratch? Well, a lot depends on your production facilities and your industrial state. A country like Japan is viewed as a turnkey, you know, that it would probably be a series of months. The uh, s suggestion is that Iran probably wants to be the similar situation, not to actually develop nuclear weapons. It probably would bring an Israeli attack, mm -hmm. but to be in a position where it could produce them. Mm. Certainly, South Korea, being a highly industrialized society, could do so within a reasonable amount of time. The question is, would it want to? And a lot of that would depend on America's attitude and the question of uh, if it would face sanctions. I mean, there are a lot of complexity to mm -hmm. it. A very complicated decision. It's one that would be up to the South Korean people. Though polls show that South Korean people actually favor it. How much of that is a, a reasoned decision? How much of that is an emotional reaction to mm -hmm. the North? I think one could argue. But that reasonable amount of time, you're talking days, weeks, months? 
Oh, it'd certainly be months or maybe early right. years. And again, it would depend. A lot would depend on America's attitude. So, <laughs> since we've done a hypothetical a moment ago, in which you imagined a scenario where uh, the South and America are fighting against North Korea, and and Kim Jong Un is threatened, and he decides to lob a nuclear missile against I don't know Seattle or Los Angeles or both. Uh, then let's also now uh, do a hypothetical in which um, the Americans say, hey, we're getting out and South Korea is going to build nuclear weapons and we're okay with that. And North Korea now has a few weeks to determine what it wants to do. Is it just going to sit there on its laurels and say, we'll just wait for our neighbors to build up some nuclear weapons as well? No, I so think that, that they can stop us from using our nuclear weapons. I don't think the U.S. picks up and leaves tomorrow. And the point no, no, is but you work. Still- the U.S. would work with South Korea to decide in terms of what the future policy would be and if South Korea wanted to develop nukes. And the U.S. would probably take that into account in terms of the timetable that it operated on. As we saw in Afghanistan, the moment when you signal your intention to leave, the moment there is even mention of a timeline, that's when activity starts to ramp up from the other side because they're now preparing for the moment that you leave. The second that the U.S. has, that, that uh, President Biden has that conversation with President Yoon and says, hey, uh, we're thinking of, re, of uh, you know, no longer carrying on this alliance. Let's uh, talk about ending it in a year or two. That's sending a signal to North Korea. We, we have now a year or two, and then uh, South Korea is on its own. Well, it wouldn't be leaving in a year or two. It would be leaving in time, you know, a time frame where South Korea can ramp up its own defense and decide what is necessary. I don't think you leave immediately where you have an alliance partner who's configured their entire defense based on your presence. But what needs to be communicated is that that's going to have to be a change. So again, you know, the U.S. should hardly be locked in forever in a commitment that no longer makes sense because it was generous enough that in the past 70 years to have maintained that commitment. You know, circumstances should dictate. The South is no longer the power that it was in 1950, 1960, 1970. It has a lot more abilities and a lot more capabilities. You know, it should act on those, and the U.S. should take that into account. Uh, you are, I think, one of the first guests to come on this show here and say that South Korea should get nuclear weapons. Five years ago, no one could speak that thought publicly. Are you noticing a lot of support for this idea in Washington, D.C., and with the people that you're meeting here in Seoul? Well, I'd say in Washington, there's, there's almost always shocked horror because whatever has been must always be. I mean, to suggest an alliance should disappear, it's, you know, Washington is a place of the status quo. Nothing ever changes. I mean, of course, NATO is always there. I mean, of course, you know, the alliance is always going to be there, whether it be with uh, the Philippines or with Japan or with, the, uh, with Korea. You know, there's good reasons to favor nonproliferation. Folks who favor nonproliferation are very strong there. You know, my view on this is that there should be a discussion, that this is not the sort of thing that one waves away, that one needs to actually talk about the future. And I found that there are a number of people rather reluctantly, people who actually favor the alliance, mm-hmm. who do talk about this because they see the problem. They see the problem of a point where North Korea is able to you know, threaten the United States, credibly threaten the United States with nuclear weapons, as transforming the risks that face the United States. And Can, that has to go into the willingness to stay in an alliance, is to recognize those costs and risks. Can you point us to any think tanks or, uh, or prominent names who are, who are saying this now in America? Uh, you, know, you, you can go back. I think it was in The Atlantic. Misha Oslin of the Hoover Institute has written about this. And I think Van Jackson, who is down in New Zealand, has mm-hmm. also written some on this. Okay. And are you, uh, have you met with any South Korean government officials who are saying, yeah, yeah, we'd like to get nukes? Well, the government officials w- won't quite say that, but they uh, certainly have had ta- po- discussions about uh, popular support. And there's an acknowledgement, the question of how strong it is and what it reflects and you know, how uh, well-reasoned it is. So it, and I think that is the difference, that in contrast to a place, a country like Japan, that in South Korea, at least two-thirds or more of South Koreans, you know, people have suggested that they would support this, at least under the right circumstances. And there's been at least one presidential candidate in years past who's raised this issue. Mm-hmm. I, I don't see support yet among kind of the policymaking community. But then, of course, the question is, what choice do they have? If the choice is bring American nukes in or build your own nukes, there's a reason to think we'd prefer to have the Americans bring in their own nukes. If the choice is America doesn't want to do extended deterrence anymore, you know, what should we do? Then my guess is there'd be a very different conversation in Seoul. Would nuclear proliferation end with South Korean going nuclear? Would you also be happy with Japanese nukes, Taiwanese nukes, Indonesian nukes? Well, being happy with is not the right answer. The question ultimately is, you know, would I find that an acceptable cost of a policy of America pulling back on extended deterrence? And the answer is yes. 
And do I think that there may be a side benefit that is contain, you know, better containment of China? I think the answer is yes. I don't think that's necessarily a good solution. Again, I, as I mentioned earlier, it's the second best. You know, my preference, I mean, I think John Bolton's preference he once expressed was that the U.S. be the only country in the world with nuclear weapons. I'd be happy with that. That's not the world we live in. That would surely be the height of American exceptionalism. Oh, yes. And it would, it would worsen the, the absolute worst instincts of every American uh, politician there. But uh, from an American security standpoint, it probably would be the best situation for the United States. But my point would be, I don't think that the expansion of, China, of uh, nuclear weapons to other countries is a, necessarily a good thing. Mm -hmm. But you know, if Taiwan had nuclear weapons, it's not at all clear that uh, China would behave the way that it behaves. Now, I do think that Taiwan is a perfect example of a place where to announce an intention to build nuclear mm. weapons would basically communicate to China to mm. attack exactly. in the meantime. So it would require the U.S. being willing to give you know, Taiwan a fully functioning nuclear arsenal, right. which is... It would be quite a move and I think quite controversial. I think we saw uh, a similar scenario, but in reverse, happening in Cuba in the 1960s, in which the Soviet Union was bringing in a fully functional oh, yeah. nuclear arsenal to Cuba, yes. which is in the American orbit. Oh, yeah. uh, I, but, but see, I, I can imagine that things <laughs> wouldn't go down much differently. No, and, and, and that's actually one reason why, as much as I like Taiwan, you know, I warn Americans they have to think very seriously about defending Taiwan. Are they prepared you know, for those stakes? recognizing, you know, kind of, uh, you know, the, the relative geographic position and the way these issues are perceived strategically, that again, the U.S. has to take these issues into account. There are a lot of Americans, I think, who kind of blunder about in the world and assume that if America is involved, nobody dare challenge the United States. And that's not the world we live in anymore. When former President Trump talked about removing troops from Korea, you must have cheered uh, inwardly or outwardly. Uh, why did that proposal not go ahead? What went wrong in your view? Well, cheer, I suppose, substantively, that is, from my standpoint, it's nice to have an American president talking about that. Mm -hmm. Not cheer in the sense that, number one, Donald Trump's not kind of capable of intellectually defending such a proposal. And it strikes me it requires a defense as opposed to simply statement. And second is there's very little in his behavior to suggest that he would do so responsibly. And again, yeah, I he's not really a process guy, is he? No, not at all. And, and as I mentioned, I wouldn't pull everybody out tomorrow. It strikes me what you know, it matters how you leave. And we mm. certainly saw that. In, in Afghanistan. Afghanistan. So to my mind, it requires, re if you want to pull out of an established alliance, it actually requires more effort than staying in. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, President Trump was not the kind of guy to, you know, come up with that. So uh, we actually long had debates at my institute about whether Trump was good or bad for our viewpoint <laughs> when he st said things that we actually agreed with, or was he discrediting the views that we were articulating? Mm. And there was no uh, final judgment oh. on that, that we, we had a very real concern that very often he acted out of emotion as opposed to thought. Mm. And in our view, these are policies that require an awful lot of study and work as opposed to just you know, blowing them off in a tweet. How did you personally feel? Uh, what, what, side did, what side did you come down on? Do you feel he was helping your cause or hurting your cause? My general view was that he brought to the fore issues that otherwise never would be talked about in Washington. So I thought that was an advantage. Mm -hmm. Even though clearly the way he talked about it and the way the conversation went you know, at times undercut the arguments I would want to make. Uh, in December last year, you uh, wrote a piece for the Cato Institute website titled, Which Will South Korea Choose, the U.S. or China? When you wrote that piece, you left it as an open question at the conclusion as to which giant superpower South Korea would choose. Did you have an inkling when you wrote that piece? Did you feel you knew, uh, did you feel you knew, yeah, which way South Korea would go? No, I th it strikes me that South Korea is still in a very difficult position. I mean, President Yoon clearly has a different view than President Moon had. I mean, it, it, from an American standpoint, the good news is that uh, China is its own worst enemy. You know, the, you know with the, uh, the sanctions, if you want to call them that, that it applied after the THAAD deployment, turned public opinion very strongly against it in uh, you know, South Korea. The problem, of course, is geography matters an awful lot. And you have this huge neighbor next door that will always be your neighbor. Mm. You know, it's very difficult to have a more hostile attitude. And the economic, uh, of course... You know, uh, you know, coupling is so very strong that it's hard to imagine pulling that apart. So I think South Korea is always going to have this problem of you know, looking security in many ways culturally and, uh, and in certain ways ideologically in terms of a freedom society, et cetera, looking at the United States while facing you know, the economic colossus nearby that matters as well as the negative security impacts of being too close to the United States. So I don't think that process is complete. And I don't think there's, that South Koreans have 
you know, a very good choice here that, uh, you know, South Koreans I know want to live in a free society and don't like what they see in China. Nevertheless, they realize there are costs in terms of the connection over the long term and how they place themselves. Since you wrote that piece in December last year, what feedback have you received from South Koreans about that choice and how it's being made? I think to some degree that there's a, an elaborate dance that's going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, we certainly saw that a bit with President Moon. We even saw that a bit with uh, President Yoon going, for example, to the NATO uh, conference mm -hmm. in Madrid. China clearly was not happy. Mm -hmm. They're trying to express, of course, this is not an anti-Chinese move. I mean, what you see is an attempt to try to you know, keep a very close relationship and indeed perhaps make even closer on security issues with not only the U.S. but NATO, mm -hmm. but realizing this needs to be sold in a way that is not perceived as anti-Chinese because China has demonstrated that it may very well take action and you know, create a lot of tension in the relationship if it comes down on the other side. So everything that I see suggests this is an elaborate dance that's going to go on for some time. I don't see it ending anytime soon. Uh, no, not ending, but uh, I, th I think the, uh, the signals seem quite clear from the South Korean government that it's not about to be bullied. I think uh, last year, last, last week, we had uh, Foreign Minister Park Jin state very clearly to the Chinese that, it, well, it did not see, uh, that South Korea does not see THAAD as a negotiable issue. So that's an end to the three no's policy. No, and I think that's very positive to have South Korea willing to take a stand. And that's something which China will not appreciate, but I think will be forced to respect. But clearly, there's still going to be always questions of how far to go, how to term things, how to present them. And I think that's something which South Korea is going to have a very hard time getting away from. That's just the reality of being so close mm -hmm. to what today, at least, is such a great power. I mean, China has its own problems. It's not quite the 800-pound gorilla that it's often you know, suggested to be. And I think the long term, after she goes, may very well be a different China. We certainly hope so. And may ease some of those uh, you know, decisions on South Korea's part. We'll find out in about a month and a half whether he has another, what, five, ten years? Or it almost certainly unlimited. does. That, that's one. There's very little doubt, I think, that he'll get those. Uh, you used the term uh, free riders in that December piece, openly labeling Europeans free riders and implying that South Koreans are that too. Do you actually believe that the only one getting something out of the alliance relationship is South Korea in this case? I think overwhelmingly so. I mean, I, I, I think cheap riders is probably better than free riders. South Korea devotes a larger chunk of its GDP to the, the military than the Europeans do. The Europeans are, are rather outrageous in many ways in terms of what they do. The primary benefit is defending other countries. Now, the, I do think American policymakers really enjoy being in a dominant position and certainly have gone out of their way to try to infantilize America's allies. I mean, for years, they were horrified at the thought that Europe might have an independent defense identity. I mean, the famous comment about Japan was American troops there were to be the cap in the bottle. We wanted to make sure the Japanese didn't go off and do other things. Mm -hmm. You know, you look back to the 1960s, the U.S. put enormous pressure on Park Chung-hee not to develop nuclear weapons. Yeah. So the U.S. believes and, and that. And until just a few years ago, North, uh, South Korea and the U.S. had an agreement. The, the, on South over missile, yeah. Right. W which struck me as an utter crazy policy, given the fact that what North Korea was doing. And mm -hmm. I'm glad to see that one having uh, been overturned. I think that uh, their policymakers in Washington also talk about influence without you know, the question of where that's exercised, sometimes suggests that uh, people buy American products because of alliance relationships, which I've never seen evidence of. So there are other arguments out there made, but you know, we go back to the question of uh, South Korea and China, that unless uh, South Korea is committed to allow American to use its bases in a containment mission against China, I don't even see much benefit there. I mean, it's always thrown out there that mm -hmm. isn't this great, we have more bases, on the other hand, China looks at that askance and it puts greater pressure on South Korea. I mean, Nomu Hyun you know, was very explicit about saying those bases couldn't be used without uh, you know, Seoul's permission. I, my guess is that if the U.S. came to President Yoon and said, uh, guess what, tomorrow we're going to war with China over Taiwan, mm -hmm. we want to use your bases here. I mean, that would set off a huge debate with South Korea. Sorry, hang on, let me just clarify that. We want to use South Korean bases here. Yeah, is I mean, if... The, if the U, does the U.S. get other benefits from being here? Right. But the, but the, the U.S. has its own bases here, right? It's got that giant one down there in yeah. Pyongyang. But, 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 but all, of this, but all of this is only under the pressure of the South Korean government. The U.S. does not use those bases without South Korean acceptance. So you're saying that if, if a U.S. warplane wanted to fly from Kunsan down to Taiwan to run a sortie over the, the Straits of Taiwan... Uh, it would have to go through uh, South Korean military permission? It would permission. have to have South Korean, US, uh, South Korean permission. I would there imagine. Is no, there is no way the U.S. can get involved in a shooting war 
with China mm -hmm. using weapons and bases on South Korean territory without South Korean consent. Interesting. I'd like to get that point clarified. I mean, certainly it's a, it's a pr pretty much a no-brainer that uh, the U.S. would not go to war against North Korea without South Korean permission. No, look, you, you, we, we see this elsewhere. We see this, the question of America's use of Insulik Air Base in Turkey. Mm -hmm. That is up to Turkey's permission. Back in 2003, the U.S. wanted to use Turkish territory to launch a northern front in Iraq. The mm -hmm. Turkish parliament refused to approve it. No, I mean, sovereign countries control the use of bases on their territory. Mm. This is not like an embassy. This is not like the U.S. has absolute control and can do whatever it wants. Okay. All right. Well, that's interesting. I wasn't aware of that. Okay. Let, let's imagine for a second there, economically, um, the U.S. Uh, finishes up its alliance with South Korea, brings its troops back home, brings its troops back home from NATO, brings its troops um, ships back home from the, uh, the South China Sea. Uh, enormous cost savings are, uh, are brought to book. Uh, the the, uh, the the military is, is is shrunk, and then Taiwan disappears from the map because it gets swallowed by China, and South Korea disappears from the map because it's swallowed by North Korea, and then bits of Europe get swallowed by Russia. Is there not are there not economic costs that you're not taking into account here on the United States economy that would result from the U.S. no longer projecting its force to uh, to keep the world a stable place? Well, there might be economic costs, but number one, I view those eventualities as unlikely. I mean, the likelihood of European countries disappearing to the Russia we see today, I think, is very unlikely. I see no reason why South Korea would disappear to North Korea. Okay, let's well, just start with Taiwan then, because it got that uh, that chip maker there. What's it, uh, TSMC? Right. Yeah, uh, that makes a whole lot of chips that are right. really important to America, things like automobile manufacturing and everything else that requires high tech. But, but of course, if the Chinese took it, I mean, it would disappear for them too. I mean, if you have a war, yeah, yeah. you'd be blowing up everything. No, but, look, but China I, has the capacity, unlike the U.S., to to ramp up chip manufacturing. Well, but the U.S. Itself. is actually producing the, is going to be producing those kind of facilities in the United States. Mm. You know, not only is the manufacturers are involved in that, but the U.S. Uh, Congress just passed legislation putting a lot of money into that. So they plan the diversification makes sense, irrespective of the threat of war. It makes sense to actually have production facilities elsewhere. Oh, well, of course, look. The, 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 the war is a bad thing. I mean, it's a war from, it's bad from a humanitarian standpoint. It'd be an utter tragedy. But again, the question of whether the United States should go to war with a nuclear armed power, you know, over a country like that, especially the problem of Taiwan is one of distance. The U.S. has to project power seven or 8,000 miles. The Chinese go out 100 miles. You know, this is not Cuba. if it gets permission. To use, if the U.S. has permission to use South Korean bases, well, that's that, 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 that distance. That, that's, and that's and, one of the reasons why they're desperate, and the Ch the Japanese and as well. Okinawa. Yeah, Okinawa is even but, closer. But even that, the, I mean, it's still more limited than the base facilities that uh, that China has. Mm. So the projection of power is always going to be harder. And the question, and the, the moment war games for the most part show the U.S. loses. And the problem is oh, what? Not this week, though. You've not been. Yeah, I, I saw that one, but I mean, there's been a whole raft of them in recent years that have suggested that, you know, that would. So, I mean, what this shows is: Are you prepared to fight a major conventional war without air superiority? The U.S. has never fought a major war without air superiority. It will not have air superiority over Taiwan. You know, it's in a position where the you know, the Chinese. You know, can sink American carriers. It's much easier to sink them than to build new ones. Mm -hmm. You know, sink one carrier, five or six thousand uh, sailors go to the, you know, go to the watery grave. I mean, the problem here is uh, what I worry about is that folks in the U.S. who talk about defending Taiwan, number one, assume the Chinese won't attack if we say we'll defend it, and number two, assume we'll win, even though that's not at all clear that we would. And that has to be taken into account. And I think we're living on these assumptions that, again, whatever Washington says happens. And that's simply not the case. And to my mind, there are lots of things in the world I would prefer to see not happen. But that doesn't mean that the U.S. should go to war to prevent them. I don't think the U.S. is the 911 number for the world. Doug Bandow, is there any evidence that you could be shown that would change your opinion? Well, opinion of what? I mean, defending a particular country, a broad uh, political uh, philosophy, what? Okay, well, let's start uh, very simply with where we began this, with, uh, with keeping the, uh, the alliance with South Korea and seeing value in that for the U.S. Probably not. I, I don't see the, the alliance as serving an existential interest, which I think it should if the U.S. is going to be prepared to go to war. When you, when you say existential, because we've already talked about possible economic costs there, you're saying it basically it comes down to lives, existential yeah, that, it's is it? Yeah, it, it's something vital in terms of American security. I think that's why the U.S. goes to war. I find economic arguments for war very mm -hmm. unpersuasive. It's theoretically why we got involved in some of the Middle East, and it just does, I'm prepared to pay higher oil prices if we don't send people to go die. Okay, well, that's a good place to end there. Thank you very much, Doug Bender, for coming on the NK News podcast once again. Happy to do so. Always great to see you, Jocko. Doug's thoughts can be found at the Cato Institute at cato.org and also on the Twitterverse at Doug underscore Bandau.
B-A-N-D-O-W. Ladies and gentlemen, if you already have an NK News subscription, take a look at our NK Pro platform and also our Career Pro platform, which both offer unparalleled services specifically catering to the needs of professionals who monitor developments on the Korean Peninsula. You can inquire about access or a free trial membership by writing an email to membership at nknews.org today. Also, if you have any feedback, questions, or guest recommendations, please send them to podcast at nknews.org. Our thanks, as always, go to Arias Dare and Brian Betts for facilitating this podcast, and to Gabby Magnuson, our post-recording producer genius. Thanks, and listen again next time. <laughs>